Hi, my name is Lisa Richter, the host of Talking Industrial Automation, a podcast where you get to know the people who make modern industrial automation and processing possible. In today's episode, we're talking industrial automation with Zach Scriven, an industrial automation engineer by trade and video content creator by heart. Zach is a video marketing entrepreneur. He is founder and lead content creator of Zach Scriven Media, a company that creates videos for education, motivation, and brand building. Zach also created Crush LinkedIn Video, an online course designed to help professionals maximize LinkedIn video. Zach, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Lisa. It's good to see you. Absolutely. Why don't you start by taking us through your journey from a control systems engineer to starting your own video marketing um, business? Okay, so I kind of grew up in the system integration field. My parents had a, a system integration firm focused in water distribution, water treatment. So I kind of grew up in that business. Um, you know, it wasn't long before you know I was 17, 18, delivering full you know scale PLC projects and SCADA systems and radios and automation. So I really kind of grew up in that um, in that industry. Also, at that same time, like during high school, I also had a side passion, a hobby of creating videos. Um, you know, using video to kind of express my personality, like kind of do some parodies and just really just kind of creative, but never really took it as something that I could do for a living. Um, you know, fast forward a couple years, I ended up taking over my parents' business, ran that for a few years, um, went to go work for another few firms before finally quitting that to combine. You know, I saw a lot of interesting things happening, particularly on LinkedIn, and using that to uh, create a personal brand to market and um, so I, I really just saw it as an opportunity to kind of combine my skill set and my passion into something creative and unique and really help have a bigger impact on industrial automation industry at large. So give us some examples of projects that you're working on or have worked on. So <clears throat> I kind of have three pillars to my business. So the first pillar is uh, kind of client services. So I work with clients to help them produce, like ideate, produce, edit, and post videos that will help them build their personal brand and their company's brand. So that's one aspect. And that really kind of helped, like when I transitioned, that really was what helped me pay the bills and got me being paid to do what I love. Um, the second part is my own personal brand, my own personal content, which is it's kind of an overarching story, storytelling, narrative, like coming up with some crazy idea, like coming to Asheville, North Carolina to do content and then actually seeing through to make that happen. Or, you know, I went to Dubai and um, South Africa, like all over the world to go to conferences like this, particularly around industrial automation. Um, so that's one aspect. I also work with brand sponsors to make those ventures possible. Um, you know, something that kind of ties in with the story, maybe it's related, maybe they can see a value in reaching my audience and really positioning themselves as an innovative company, trying something new. Um, so that's the second pillar. And the third pillar is I have my own podcast. It's the Zach Scriven podcast. Are you my competition? No, no, no. See, that's the thing. We're not, we're not competition. No, though. we're colleagues. We're, we're col collaborators. And yeah. uh, I actually see that as a vehicle to help work with other individuals that maybe don't maybe they're not in, ready to hire me to to help them do their marketing but they want to get started with video they want to tell their story the podcast is a platform for me to share other people's stories and also consequently my own so I, I, I find myself working with people that maybe are in a similar arc on their journey and we can kind of share stories and and uh, that's what the podcast is so how often do you drop a podcast? Uh, I try to do them about every week. So I'm on number 80 right now. Oh just my started goodness, that's so aggressive. As a podcaster myself, I'm impressed with that output. That's a, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, when you do it full time, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's go, switching from having that nine to five to being able to do this full time opened up so many opportunities for me to travel, for me to create more content, to get better at it. You know, because you could just the more you iterate, the better you get, you know. Absolutely. So give me an example of a piece of work that you're really proud of. Uh, so I'm really proud of the uh, South Africa trip that I went to uh, in March. So that one was interesting in that um, there is a local distributor for Aviva Solutions, uh, IS Cubed, Industry Software Solutions and Support. They have a um, annual conference. They're on number 27 this year. And uh, 
it's really unique in that it's more of like a performance. It's, it's really an experience to be able to go there. They have live performances, comedians, um, you know, dancers, like even like the, the final dinner, they had this show where the, the chefs came out and made dessert live in front of us and like, uh, you know, frosted powder like is flying and like they're just, so it's like all these interesting, unique experiences and the goal through the vlog is to document that in a, in a creative perspective, share that with the world. And so my goal with those videos, with those vlogs is to, you know, highlight a different uh, perspective of those events and make someone truly feel like they were there and, and, and condensed down into a five or ten minute video. Sounds like an amazing experience. So switching gears a bit, it sounds like you're an entrepreneur at heart. Yeah. Um, what traits do you think people need to be successful out on their own? So it's, it's got to, the biggest thing I think is you got to have a, a mission that truly transcends your own existence. So, you know, wow, it's one. so meta, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, it's, it's true, though, because, you know, one might think that, you know, well, if I work for this company and, and they're taking my overhead and, you know, they're charging twice what I, you know, earn, maybe I might be better off on my own and, and keeping that extra. I think those ventures might be short lived because if it's just truly about money um, or your own, like, personal incentives, then when it gets tough, then you might give up. But, um, you know, for me, it's truly about inspiring others, using myself as um, like a bit of a uh, guinea pig for the industry. So like, you know, I, I might you know, forge my own trail and, and, and help others along that same path, maybe not extreme, as extreme as me or, you know, as centric. But um, so I think back to the point is like having a, a mission that just is beyond bigger than yourself and that'll help, uh, help you fight through those ups and downs. What do you find most challenging about owning your own business? Uh, for me, it's um, mostly organizational. So I'm you know, like a very uh, not organized. I'm actually very, like a lot of my stuff is from the hip. And I don't really, like, you know, you have a script and I've never scripted any of my podcasts. Um, and so that for me is like my weakness, but it's also my strength. So I just try to figure out how, how can I use my you know, lack of structure to be creative, but at the same time, make sure that each month I'm delivering my deliverables. I'm, you know, bills are getting paid, income's coming in, looking at, you know, hiring my first video editor. So like, those are things that are stepping outside of my comfort zone. And, uh, but for me, the biggest struggle is that organizational aspect. Um, Cause as a creator, I'm very creative. I, I don't like to be, you know, like tied down or, um, like a lot of my sponsors, it's just, I don't really have a set list of deliverables. They just kind of give me that creative freedom to create the way that I want. And, and usually that works, but the, you know, that doesn't work for everyone. So it's trying to find that balance of like complete chaos and complete structure. Yeah, but you know, the good news on that is the organization bit is easy to outsource, right? Yeah. You can find lots of people who are organized and will keep a schedule and keep you on track or whatever, yeah, that's yeah. easy to outsource. So switching gears yet again, we hear a lot about millennials and often it's not very complimentary. Do you think the stereotypes of the younger generation, your generation really, yeah, yeah. Um, ring true? Oh, absolutely. So I think the thing that needs to follow that though is there's also a lot of positive traits. And I think what leaders need to recognize when dealing with those millennials is to focus on those strengths and not necessarily like get stuck on the issues. Um, you know, millennials are told like since the day we were born that like we could be president, we can change the world. And a lot of, you know, we believe that and that's a strength, but it's also a weakness in, you know, like some of the negative points, like we, we may be come off as entitled or, um, and et cetera. But I think that that's really where leaders have the opportunity to hone in on that, that, that desire to make a change, that desire to make a difference to, you know, I guess kind of not necessarily control millennials, but like keep them within the rails against a, a bigger mission that um, they can feel like they're truly having an impact towards. So at the same time, we hear um, so much that companies are struggling to attract and retain talent. Why do you think that is and, and how could companies solve for that? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is having values-based 
uh, organizations um, that extend you know, beyond just making a profit. Um, and also having a mission that is tangible, that people can buy into. Um, so like Airbnb kind of comes to mind of a truly mission-based organization, like helping empower homeowners and, and travelers to connect, right? Um, um, as opposed to just, you know, like being the best in the, in the world is not really a measurable goal that people can get behind. I think being, you know, like one of my clients, their, their mission is to save and create middle-class jobs in the United States through revitalizing manufacturing, making manufacturers more competitive. Like that's something that you can actually get buy into because you can see the impact that it, you know manufacturing jobs have on local communities and like what the outsourcing of manufacturing did like in the 80s and 90s. So to actually have that like as your life's mission, you can actually get people that buy into that same mission and and truly have an impact. Also, um, it'd be silly to talk about this without mentioning money. So it's not all about money. I think you'll find that people will be willing to work for less if they truly do have a mission that they're bought into themselves. Um, but also, like that's not an excuse to underpay. I think you can be both competitive in pay and also have a, a mission that's beyond just turning a profit. So help me understand why you think maybe organizations are struggling to attract talent. Is it because it's just not glamorous, or are we not telling our story properly? Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of options out there. You know, the economy is doing really well. There's a lot of new jobs. The gig economy is, I think, a big portion of that. You know, um, a lot of engineers are maybe finding alternatives that where they can work on online platforms and, and have more flexibility. Um, but I think, you know, going back to that mission, having a, a, a being part of a group where the collective mission is something bigger than yourselves is going to be key in retaining that top talent. Um, as well as transparency. So a lot of business practices have kind of through momentum carried into from the past where, you know, th like these business practices are before the internet. Like, for example, salary, uh, lack of transparency on salary. You know, that's, that was a huge one back in the day where you just kind of kept everything private so that way you could basically get away with paying someone less than their market value. With the internet and, and things like Glassdoor and, you know, those, those, those things aren't going to exist anymore. So people are really going to, I mean, people don't mind if their manager makes more, but they want to actually see a, a tie between the contribution to the mission and someone's pay. And so I think transparency is really the best way to, to retain that top talent because I think one of the biggest reasons people do leave is they, they might get an offer somewhere else to make more money. And um, I don't think that's a great idea to leave on that alone, but I think, you know, have, being in a spot where you do feel like you're underpaid does make that more enticing. Mm -hmm. you know? So speaking of the next generation, what's in store for Zach 2.0? Are, are we on 3.0, 4.0? Where are we? <laughs> Humans 2.0. Oh, wow. I, I still feel like it's very early in my, in my transition. Um, so the way that I... sounds a little weird. <laughs> it, it, it does sound weird, but I actually think I have a very deep perspective on this. So really, you know, we're going through the digital transformation of industry. You know, we, we see that all the time in the stuff that we talk about. But less people focus on the digital transformation of self or the digital transformation of leadership. So like through this podcast, these are digital waves going into someone's ears or through video, it's, you know, digital signals coming into their retina. Um, the stuff that we did not have 20 years ago, like being able to just pull out your phone and create a video, hit send and reach thousands or millions of people. Um, it's very much a, like a one to many relationship, just like having a digital document. You don't need to print a million copies. You could have that digital document. Everyone can have the same source of truth. You can iterate faster, like look at online learning. So truly I am in a process of Transform. I know it kind of sounds like I'm uploading my content. Yeah, we are bored. <laughs> but we are truly like, you know, each thing that I say on video, it is kind of uploading to the cloud in a way that is very much my personality. And it's a, it's a digital twin of myself. So I'd say it's still very early, maybe one, Zach 1.1. 1. 1. <laughs> <laughs> so we're recording this podcast during the CSIA Executive Conference, which is why it's probably a little noisy in the background for folks. Is this your first time here, and what are you most looking forward to experiencing? This is my first time here. I'm very excited to be here. Welcome. And um, 
I'm most looking forward to um, meeting with other system integrators and seeing how, how I can help them um, transform their marketing and their messaging. Maybe I want to start seeing more system integrators adopting some of the practices that I've been employing with my clients, whether that's uh, you know them as a client myself or maybe that's them taking a course that I developed so I can you know amplify I can I can help a lot more people through a digital course than I can one on one, so that's another theme of that digital transformation, right? Mm -hmm. um, but really just maybe in getting feedback from them, maybe why haven't they started looking at video to get their messaging out um, and, and seeing kind of where the industry is and what their feedback is on, on my own journey and, and yeah, just networking. I think the stereotype of engineers is that they are very skeptical of marketing. Oh, I, I totally agree. Yeah? I used to be anti-marketing, anti-sales. <laughs> I think it didn't, do, it didn't serve me well. Mm -hmm. I think truly embracing it, I, it was a flip of a switch. I did have to kind of come to love marketing but I think you know a lot of marketers and sales people in the past may have given it a bad, you know, left a bad taste in someone's mouth. But I think that's why like authenticity, transparency, when you combine that with marketing, like people really see me being authentic on my videos. Like they they trust when I am working with a brand that I actually believe in that brand myself and that I'm not just doing it to get paid. Mm -hmm. So when you combine authenticity, transparency with video, I think people will really like they, they get over that, uh, like that fear of like, oh, I don't really trust what you're saying because I think you're trying to sell me something. If you can kind of connect with someone on a deeper level, a human level, where it's just, you know, like we're talking right now, just person to person, um, I think that's where they can really start to see the value of, of marketing and branding and, and sales. So the system integrator was sort of interested in dipping his or her toes into this marketing water, right, where what they? advice would you give them? I would, uh, I would start by um, telling their story. I think there's a lot of stories that are um, you know, maybe left for the fireside, but there's no reason that the, those can't be out shared um, because it might help other system integrators. And I think that's one of the things that I've always kind of disliked about the industry is that everyone kind of keeps to themselves. It's kind of very competitive in that regard. And I, I do see that starting to change with more community and more collaborating um, you know life is not a zero-sum game so you can help someone else out I think that's actually the, the easiest way to success is helping other people reach success um, so I think sharing their story how they started their company um, maybe they had a failure on a project I know that's something that you guys talk about at the CSIA is sharing some failures um, but they always have a happy ending <laughs> yes well I think that's that's uh, that's true but I think I don't think it always needs to be a happy ending. I think, you know, I think a lot of the fear of people coming on camera is they, they, they try to feel like they have to know everything and that showing what they don't know. Like, if I go on camera, then someone might see that I, I'm really specialized maybe in PLC, but my SCADA skills are not as strong. They, th they see it as a weakness, but I see vulnerability as a strength. And then you'll actually connect with someone more. And, um, you know, not everyone knows everything, right? That's why we work together. So. Um, I'd say I'd start with, you know, maybe just even their phone and just sharing like a weekly video about uh, like what's happening in their business and just kind of opening that up for sharing. And I think I think it'll create a really big impact. So any final words for our listeners? Oh, man, thank you guys so much for listening. Um, you guys are all awesome. Lisa, thank you for having me on. It's uh, it's really awesome uh, to be here, you know, as a as a representative of the media new new media uh alternative media but also just you know here on the podcast it, it is uh you know it's a sign of my own progress and journey and and giving that little bit of you know validation back to myself that i am doing something that is you know truly trying to help the industry and, and people are seeing that and that does feel good so where should people go if they want to learn more about you uh they can reach out to me on linkedin uh zach scriven z-a-c-k scriven rhymes with driven uh, or my YouTube channel, Zach Scriven Media, or my, my website, ZachScriven.com. That's where you can also find my podcast. So You're there. I'm, I'm, I'm everywhere. Google it, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so that's it for today's episode of Talking Industrial Automation. Thanks for listening, and thank you, Zach, for joining me today. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Let's see if that took. <laughs>